as we study the a new uh, a new section, a new uh, series, the Kingdom of God. We just finished the uh, Calvinism series, Calvin's Tulip, and I want us to talk about the Kingdom of God. Uh, we'll go two or three weeks on it anyway, and uh, discuss this issue of the Kingdom of God, which I really think is one of the most important issues facing the church today. It may not seem like it to you because there's not a lot of debate about the kingdom of God. And I think that the problem is there's not a lot of debate about the kingdom of God. Rather, the church almost wholesale has adopted, I think, a wrong view of the kingdom of God. Sometimes there are some of you perhaps who uh, hold a correct view of the kingdom of God. I hope some of you might be surprised tonight uh, about what the kingdom of God is and as we study this. But Sometimes I feel like, boy, well, kind of like Elijah. Is there anyone who's got the view of the kingdom right? They're out there. I know that they, they are, and uh, I visit with uh, some from time to time, and I find some from time to time. But by and large, if you, uh, if you just pick a church and go into that church, or you pick a Christian ministry or website and go into that ministry or website, they're going to have a bad view of the kingdom of God. That's just my experience. And so I want us really to study this issue tonight of the kingdom of God and uh, spend a couple of weeks on it and learn to see exactly what is the kingdom of God. So as uh, we consider the issue here of the kingdom of God, I, let me just uh, begin by saying that there are very few topics as widely covered in the Bible than the kingdom of God. Uh, I mean, you can talk about money. There's a lot of money in the Bible. You can talk about salvation. There's a lot of salvation in the Bible. You can talk about health. You can talk about prosperity. You, know, you can talk about uh, Israel. But, but the kingdom of God just over and over and over again seems to come up in the Bible. In fact, in the King James Version, 70 times in the New Testament, there is the phrase, the kingdom of God. That's just in the New Testament. 70 times the kingdom of God. And the fact that you add to that, 33 times the kingdom of heaven. That is over 100 times the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Now, we'll spend some time in a future week and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll nail this down for you. But let me just say right now that I believe the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same thing. So over 100 times in the New Testament, we have these references to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's all through the Old Testament as well. It's not uh, used by, under that title, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, but it's just prevalent all through the scripture. Very few topics so widely covered. In fact, I don't, I don't know outside of some very broad topic like Jesus himself, if you could find an issue or a topic in which you could say very specifically, it comes up a hundred times and even more. So here it is. Very few topics as widely covered as the kingdom of God. And yet, I think that if you were just to go into a Bible study class, maybe a Sunday school class this Sunday, and you were to uh, take that little group around and say, you know, a hundred and uh, plus times the King James Version speaks about the kingdom of God. Who knows what it is? I think you get a lot of blank stares. I think you get a lot of this and that, a, little, a lot of him hawing, and a lot of what we do in church, that is just making stuff up and uh, giving some sort of answer that is not necessarily biblical. So, Let's try to figure all of this out and come to understand what the kingdom of God is. I want us tonight to look at just a few sample passages to uh, begin to learn about the kingdom of God. And uh, we'll just start out uh, with 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 16, where uh, we see, uh, as I uh, get this on the screen here, excuse me, and uh, make this just a little bit larger for you so you can see it well. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 16 says, Then Samuel said to Saul, uh, well, let's see, I'll tell you what, I got that wrong, didn't I? Let's go to Second Samuel and uh, chapter 15, verse 16, and hopefully uh, that is right, and uh, maybe that's not even right, uh, as I uh, obviously have the uh, wrong passage here. Uh, let me see here. Well, I'll tell you what. It's the uh, passage. Someone will find it for me in a moment. But it's the uh, passage that speaks about uh, the, uh, the uh, issue of uh, David being promised that there would be a king who would reign forever. 
Uh, and uh, we'll get to that uh, passage here in just a moment, and I'll get that correct before I send out uh, these um, slides for you. And uh, then let's look at Psalm 145, uh, beginning in verse 11. Psalm 145, verse 11 says, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. Now, that was the promise that was given to David that uh, there was, his, his kingdom would become an everlasting kingdom. Now, that Davidic kingdom promised to David is described in terms of God, your kingdom. So it became to be known as the kingdom of God. The throne of David is the kingdom of God. Now, uh, that's in uh, Psalm 144, as I'm uh, going to uh, the next passage, by the way, which is Isaiah chapter 9, verse uh, 7. Nicholas asks a, a very great question, and uh, that is, why does the New American Standard Bible have fewer uh, uh, term uses of kingdom of God than does the King James Version. We'll show you in a moment there's one that has far fewer, and actually I'm going to spend some time on that. Not tonight, but we're going to come to that issue in future weeks, Nicholas, because I want us to see how some of the translators, because they have an incorrect view of the kingdom of God, rather than translate, they made a commentary. They didn't want to put the kingdom of God because it didn't fit their uh, theological view, and so they left it out. And we're going to spend some time on that uh, very uh, question, uh, Nicholas, uh, not tonight, but in a few weeks. Now, here's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. In fact, let's uh, back up to verse 6 because you know what it says, verse 6. A child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then verse 7, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. By the way, just to put that, uh, the last phrase right there into your mind as you think about the kingdom of God. How is the kingdom of God going to be initiated? There we have the answer, don't we? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So it's one of our representative scriptures on the kingdom of God. Now, let's uh, look at another one. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. We will, in future weeks, spend some more time on uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 40 uh, in, in this uh, passage and learn more about what Daniel says about the divine kingdom. But just a bit here, it says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. That kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Now, there is the divine kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom that God sets up. And uh, uh, it, it, something enlightening as well. You remember, how is it going to happen? According to uh, the last passage that we were in in Isaiah, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Here we see it in Daniel 2. God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Now, when is this going to happen? Again, don't worry if you're not getting it all yet. We're just getting some summary views. But when is all this going to happen? It says, in the days of those kings. We'll have to look at those kings. But if we were to look up, this is the ten kings that come out of the, uh, the, the Roman kingdom. That means it hadn't happened yet. Just in a, a simple summary view of the kingdom of God. Well, let's look at another one in the New Testament. Let's consider Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. And uh, here the scripture uh, comes, and uh, you have John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching the wilderness of Judea, saying what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, uh, as uh, we see, in fact, let me just pull up that uh, little literal translation. That is, the kingdom of heaven has come near. That is, you don't have it. It is near. So, 
as uh, we're considering the kingdom of God then, we, we see there's just a, a sampling, not all of these, only in fact one of these uh, mentions the kingdom of God. One more I want us to look at, and that's Acts chapter 1, verse 6. And uh, we see that uh, G- the disciples come together and they ask Jesus a question. Here's the question. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, the disciples, these are the apostles, really, they had an understanding of the kingdom, and they had one last question to ask the Lord before he ascended into heaven. Is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They seemed to understand what the kingdom was. So here it is. Uh, hundreds of times, a uh, hundred times in the New Testament we could go through, and uh, that's just when the phrase is used. We could look at the concept, New Testament, Old Testament, over and over again. We would find it there, and we would study this issue of the kingdom of God. So very few topics as widely covered in the Bible than the kingdom of God. But let me say in the second place, Very few issues, I believe, are as widely misunderstood as the kingdom of God. Why is it that something that is there over and over and over and over again, so much so that it seems that any understanding of it would be uber clear? It would be as uh, it would be crystal clear. And yet, in the church today, there's a huge misunderstanding about what the kingdom of God is. Very few issues. Now, to Nicholas's question earlier, uh, let me uh, show you uh, this uh, particular word here. The, the, the message, which I don't even, by the way, consider a Bible, uh, but the message is uh, that which, uh, excuse me just a moment, that which uh, uh, is, I consider it a commentary on the Bible, and uh, it uh, tells us that, uh, or it, excuse me, only uses the, uh, the, the kingdom of God, the phrase the kingdom of God, 19 times. Now, why 19 times instead of the, uh, the, the, the 70, uh, uh, well, the 70 times that uh, the King James uses? Something says you've got to figure out what's going on here, right? What's up here? in that uh, this is happening. And uh, so we see there's obviously some kind of a misunderstanding. I want to bring some scripture back here because Rhonda helped me. And it's First Samuel chapter 13, verse 13. Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, which you commanded, for the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Now your kingdom will not endure, but the Lord's looking for another one. And if you follow this through, then you'll find out that eventually the Lord promises to David a kingdom, and that is the kingdom that we today call the Davidic kingdom, or it will be the kingdom of God. So we've got all of these issues that are, are, uh, are, are, are obviously misunderstood when the message is not even using the phrase. I think it's because there's a theological reason they're not using the phrase. Now, what has the kingdom of God come to mean? I I want to show you uh, just a a little bit from uh, the the web, and I've got a a series of uh, sites that I've searched for you earlier here that uh, hopefully you can see on the screen right now. And I want to just give you a sampling of if you, if you Google kingdom of God, what is the kingdom of God is actually the term I use. Here are some of the uh, samples that uh, I've seen here. Now, here's one, gracethroughfaith.com. I'm honestly not familiar with the uh, site. Somebody, one of you actually sent me uh, the link to this one. And the individual uh, mentions that uh, as, as, a, as a Christian, I'm going to uh, enlarge this just a little bit so that uh, perhaps you can... Uh, see it here. Uh, As a Christian, I'm aware that once saved, a Christian should seek his kingdom and his righteousness as you have taught. Now, the question is, what does that mean? And uh, the answer, your relationship with the Lord is not based on a set of rules. It's the attitude of the heart. Therefore, seeking the Lord's kingdom and his righteousness, as he has admonished us to do, is a matter of making his will for you the first priority in your life. So 
This is close to what Rhonda has said here. God rules in our heart. So we see, according to this particular website, to seek his kingdom and his righteousness means make his will first priority in your life. Well, here's one uh, that comes from uh, gotquestions.org. And uh, let me make this a little bit bigger for you. The question is very clear. What is the kingdom of God? Well, what's their answer? The kingdom of God is the rule of an eternal sovereign God over creatures and things. The kingdom of God is also the designation for the sphere of salvation entered into at new birth and is synonymous with the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God embraces all created intelligence, both in heaven and earth, that are willingly subject to the Lord and are in fellowship with him. The kingdom of God is, therefore, universal in that it includes angels and men, and it goes on to describe. Now, what you see here is what is the kingdom of God? Well, it's almost, a, it's almost everything. It's uh, God's rule, uh, eternal sovereign rule. That means the kingdom of God, I guess, has always been, because God has always been eternally sovereign, hadn't he? The kingdom of God is... Uh, is, is what you enter into when you come into new birth. So the kingdom of God is the Christian life. Uh, and so this is gotquestions.org. Uh, and uh, here's, here's another one. This uh, comes from uh, John Piper's organization, Desiring God. And uh, Piper has a sermon, Is the Kingdom Present or Future? He comes down uh, to uh, mention a text that we'll look into in future weeks, look into very closely, Luke 17, 20 through 21, which Piper says, uh, again, let me uh, enlarge this just a little bit so you can see it. It says, uh, our text is a clear statement that Christ's own coming is the coming of the kingdom. In other words, summarize it right here, the, king, the, the kingdom of God is Christ own coming, the first coming. He uses this uh, particular passage of scripture, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, lo, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom is in the midst of you. Now, here's what Piper says. First, Jesus begins, I want you to catch this, Jesus begins to correct a misunderstanding of the kingdom, namely, that it would come with such observable signs to be mistaken. Rome would be overturned, Israel would be vindicated, and an earthly kingdom would be established. Jesus says, no, it's not coming that way. Now, it's very common, we're going to hit on this later, that uh, there are so many with a misunderstanding of the kingdom of God that say, here it is, that uh, Rome would be un overtur overturned, Israel vindicated, an earthly kingdom would be established. Jesus came, he, Piper says, to correct that misunderstanding. Well, here's another one. This is uh, a, a Catholic view of the kingdom of God. Again, what is the kingdom of God? And uh, the scripture comes uh, down. What is the kingdom of God that so preoccupied Jesus? Certainly not a kingdom in a worldly sense. My kingdom is not of this world. So, uh, whatever it is, and if you uh, go down uh, further, you uh, begin to see that uh, this Catholic teaching very clearly is that the kingdom of God is the, uh, the rule and the reign of God. Uh, right here, the kingdom of God has a similar meaning. It exists wherever God's will is at work. And God's will is at work wherever people are faithful to the command that we love one another as God first loved us. So when we love each other, we let God's will, that is the kingdom of God. That's uh, according to the Catholics. Well, then we can come here to uh, the Colson Center and see what Chuck Colson has to say about the kingdom of God, and he talks about the Old Testament ending in expectation, and then the New Testament comes with the voice of John the Baptist, and at long last God was at work again, and there, he says, was the inauguration of the kingdom of God. And uh, going on, uh, he says there's, there's obviously some problem about uh, understanding the kingdom of God, but here's his uh, response. What is the kingdom of God? He uh, talks about the rule and the reign of God. And so the kingdom of God, as you continue to read, is wherever God rules and reigns. Thus, the New Testament nuance for the kingdom in these verses connected to the exertion of God's will, the act of ruling or reigning, the exercise of authority. When I was in seminary and I asked, what's the kingdom of God? They said, it's the rule of God. 
in, in our hearts. Well, here's one from Grace Communion International. That's the former Wor Worldwide Church of God, by the way. And uh, they've got some interesting views, but uh, they talk about the present and future kingdom, something I want you to notice here. Many first century Jews could identify with the phrase kingdom of God. Obviously, they could. It was used so many times in the New Testament. They eagerly wanted God to send them a leader and throw off Roman rule and make Judea an independent nation again, a nation of righteousness, glory, and blessing, and uh, it goes on. Now, uh, later, the kingdom most people hoped for did not happen. So, here uh, uh, this uh, organization says, well... We don't believe that Jesus was wrong. Rather, the popular hopes and speculations were wrong. Now, you'll hear this over and over and over. They expected a physical kingdom, but they were wrong, and Jesus came to correct them, to get it right. Uh, R.C. Sproul, the kingdom is now, and he goes on with the uh, same uh, kind of argument that uh, is given as he comes finally and says, his kingdom is not extending his boundaries. Wherever there is a there, there he reigns. So God's kingdom, according to R.C. Sproul, uh, seems to be everywhere with the rule and the reign. Now, you can see, you can get all sorts of ideas. By the way, I don't think we got the right one yet in any of those. But the kingdom of God has come to mean so many things. Some say, well, the kingdom of God means anything God does. That's his kingdom. The kingdom of God is the church. The kingdom of God is wherever God rules and reigns. The kingdom of God is the sovereignty of God. But I think all of these don't get at what the kingdom of God is. And if we want to know what the kingdom of God is, we can look to all these websites or we can look into the word of God and find out what the kingdom of God is. It's very important because an error in understanding the kingdom will permeate through your entire theological framework. I want to say that again. If you get this wrong, you'll get your theology wrong in so many places. It is bedrock, fundamental, absolutely essential. And let me just say it this way. As you interpret the kingdom of God, so your theology will be built. So if you interpret it this, the, the, the wrong way, then it's got, you're, you're going to have some real issues and some real problems. Let me tell you that uh, something that, is, uh, that, that you see, I think, built upon bad kingdom theology. Um, well, before I get there, let me ask this question. What do you do with Matthew 6.33? You remember what Matthew 6.33 says, don't you? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added unto you. Now, you've got to define the kingdom of God, don't you? And to my point here, if you get it wrong, you're going to carry out Matthew 6:33 wrong. You have to define the kingdom of God so that you know how to seek it, don't you? So, is the kingdom of God anything God does? Then seek that and all these things will be added unto you. Is the kingdom of God the church? Then seek the church and all these things will be added unto you. Is the kingdom of God wherever God rules and reigns? Then seek that where God rules and reigns and then all these things will be added unto you. Is the kingdom of God the sovereignty of God? Then seek the sovereignty of God and all these things will be added unto you. On and on you can put in all these definitions to see what they are, and find out if it works. Now, we've already seen one website here that uh, says uh, uh, the, that uh, we, we ought to seek to have our spiritual priorities right. And very often, when I uh, sit in a pew uh, and, and listen to a sermon, which is almost never, but uh, it, when, when I hear sermons on Matthew 6.33 or read books on Matthew 6.33 or hear Sunday school lessons or just popular talk among Christians about Matthew 6.33, what they say is get your spiritual life in order, have your spiritual priorities right, and then all these things will be added unto you. The problem is that's not true, is it? People who have their spiritual priorities, right, sometimes all these things are not added unto them. And so then we begin to qualify it and say, well, we didn't mean all these things. We didn't mean these things. We didn't mean that things. And, and uh, all, all these, uh, the spinning around we need to do when I think if you understand the kingdom of God, then you can, without hesitancy, without batting an eye or back up an inch, you can say, Seek the kingdom of God, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you, and you don't have to redefine anything at all if you get the kingdom of God right. And uh, 
So we uh, begin to uh, deal with this uh, issue. So got to get it right or you'll mess up Matthew 6.33, for example. Now, there's some errors built on, uh, I call it bad kingdomology. And uh, these errors uh, that we built, one of them is just a charismatic theology. Uh, you know that I'm not a charismatic. And as uh, we consider this issue, uh, let me tell you that really – uh, you can't be a charismatic without believing that the kingdom of God is already here and already established in some form or, or fashion. So the charismatic theology has to have at its core, we could talk about it some more sometime, a present kingdom of some sort. Uh, another error built on, uh, on bad uh, kingdomology is a reconstruction theology. That is Reconstructionism. The new apostolic reformation, of course, is charismatic, but it's also dominionist. It is, it is taking over society. All that's built upon a bad kingdom theology. So as uh, we will uh, get this uh, looked up here, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come to it. I'm reading some of your questions. I see Jeannie and uh, Sandy have asked a question that I'm going to come back to later, so uh, don't worry about those. I will get to those because uh, they're very relevant. Now, uh, let's talk about the kingdom of God, what it is, and first of all, how it relates to a biblical worldview. Because I'm convinced that you have to have uh, a good kingdom theology to have a biblical worldview. If you don't understand the kingdom, then you don't have a good biblical worldview. So let's ask the question, when was the kingdom of God established? Now, we can ask uh, all the websites, we can talk about it with one another, or we can go to the Word of God. How many want to vote for the Word of God? So let's see, when was the kingdom of God uh, established or, uh, or, or uh, envisioned, perhaps even would be a better word? When was the idea, when did this idea for the kingdom of God come up? And uh, to answer the question, I want us to look to Matthew chapter 25, verse uh, 34 where the scripture says, uh, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of the father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, that answers a, a big question, doesn't it? Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That is, Right then, at the beginning of the creation, there was a kingdom that was being prepared. It hadn't necessarily been fulfilled. It's obviously not until this point when they say, come now, it's ready. But let's uh, consider it. So it was established there uh, at the, at the, uh, at the uh, foundations of the world. This means that creation was the preparation for the work of God. This helps you to build a biblical worldview. From the foundation of the world, God was preparing a kingdom. That is, he laid the foundation because he wanted to build something on it. And what he wanted to build on it was a kingdom, a kingdom that later would be given to, uh, to uh, the elect people who, by the way, were elect from before the foundation of the world. So he had this elect group of people, if uh, study the our a series on election sometime, Calvinism. I believe it's the nation of Israel. He had this elect group of people that he wanted to give to a kingdom and to give that as an inheritance to his son. And uh, he, he elect them before the foundation of the world. And then he laid the foundations of the world to establish this kingdom. So creation was the preparation of the work of God. This is a biblical worldview. Creation is not an end unto itself nor is creation incidental to God's plan. You see, a lot of people with their view of the kingdom, their spiritual view of the kingdom, creation is not really needed. This world is not really needed. And uh, let the world come, go, whatever. We just happen to be here. I'm a pilgrim. I'm passing through. Don't really need this. But the Bible says, no, from the beginning, from the foundation, here was the establishment of this kingdom, and creation is a part of it. So kingdom theology provides us with a purpose for matter, that is, for stuff. And the purpose for stuff is that God wanted in this creation to, uh, to create a royal kingdom in creation. King Edward the uh, Sixth's Catechism 
says, uh, and, and by the way, I'm not familiar, uh, uh, terribly familiar with his catechism. My guess is he's wrong on a lot of things. But he speaks about creation. He says, before the Lord God made heaven and earth, he determined to have for himself a most beautiful kingdom and a holy commonwealth. Well, he got it right on there that there is uh, this, uh, exactly, Gregory, there's uh, creation, there's subjects, there's a kingdom that is uh, going to be given. So creation is, I think, the sphere in which the kingdom will be established or created. That is, it came about from the foundation of the world that the kingdom, the foundations of the kingdom were established in the foundations of the world. And so creation is the sphere in which the kingdom was created. Now, think about that for a moment. I know that you're saying, well, Pastor, you're sort of flying off on the moon here. I don't know where you're going with this. But this is very important because we're asking what's the kingdom going to be. We need to ask with that, where is the kingdom going to be? And here I think we see a where. The kingdom is going to be right here on earth, on creation. It was created for that. And so to place the kingdom in another sphere voids the purposes of the world's foundation to begin with. So to have a biblical worldview of this world around us, we have to understand the kingdom. Now, why is there so much confusion about the kingdom of God? I think, uh, you know, the definitions just go everywhere. Albert Barnes is uh, uh, not, he wrote Barnes Notes, not one of my favorite commentaries, commentators. In fact, I think he, uh, he's a covenant theologian, and uh, he gets a lot of stuff wrong, in my opinion. But uh, uh, Albert Barnes, in volume one, page 39 of Barnes Notes, he writes some definitions of the kingdom of God. And here's a list that he gives. He says the kingdom of God is Messiah's spiritual reign. The kingdom of God is when the gospel is advanced. The kingdom of God is the effect of the gospel. That is love and justice. The kingdom of God is piety on the heart. The kingdom of God is the church. The kingdom of God is being saved. The kingdom of God is heaven. The kingdom of God is the world to come. Well, what in the world is the kingdom of God? This is why you go into your Bible study classes and say a hundred times more, the scripture speaks about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven specifically, explicitly, and other times it has the concept. So what is it? And you go around the room and they say, well, it's uh, the rule and reign of God in the heart. It's the gospel. It's the peace and justice of God. It's, the, it's when you're, you're, you're pious, pious. It's when you have your spiritual priorities right. It's when you get saved and you're born again. It's heaven. It's the world to come. The kingdom of God is the sovereignty of God. Let's just say the kingdom of God is everything. How about that? Okay, seek ye first the kingdom of God then. How are we going to narrow this down and uh, put it down to figure out what exactly is really the kingdom of God? I don't believe, by the way, that the kingdom of God is wherever God rules and reigns. Because, uh, you know, God has always somewhat ruled and reigned, hasn't he? And, uh, and yet the kingdom of God established, well, certainly hadn't been, uh, I mean, with, uh, it's, it just, uh, there's as many arguments about when the kingdom of God was established as there are when uh, or what the kingdom of God is. Again, it's all over the map. Pick a commentary, and uh, it'll, it'll uh, be different than the next commentary you pick is the way that it goes. So we come with all of that little background then, and let's ask a question. What was the Jewish understanding of the kingdom in Jesus' day? Here John, John the Baptist comes preaching, doesn't he? And he is preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. That word at hand means near. The kingdom of God is near. Jesus starts preaching it then. The kingdom of God is near. Jesus sends out his apostles and 70. He sends out 70 uh, uh, disciples, you remember, and says, hey, go, proclaim the kingdom. He didn't tell them what to proclaim. They already know what to proclaim. Proclaim the kingdom of God. They didn't come out to John the Baptist when John said, the kingdom of God is at hand, and say, uh, John, I've, I've got a question. Would you tell me what are you talking about? What's all this stuff about a kingdom? Are you talking about God's rule and reign? Are you talking about having our spiritual priorities right? Are you talking about uh, God's sovereignty? What in the world do you know? They didn't ask those questions because they already, in their mind, had a very firm understanding. And all the Jewish people of that day, both then and now, had an understanding of the kingdom of God. You go into a Baptist church, and uh, they won't understand at all when you ask, what's the kingdom of God? Go into a Jewish synagogue and ask, and they'll immediately be able to give you an answer. Now, 
What about in that day, in this day, the Jewish understanding of the kingdom of God? Let me give a summary first, uh, and then we'll back up and look at some specifics. A summary of the Jewish understanding of the kingdom. They understood the kingdom to be like this. There would be a personal coming of the Messiah. That is, the Messiah would show up in the flesh. Here he would be. He'd be a real person. He'd have he'd have thumbprints. I mean, he would be a living, breathing, in the flesh Messiah. He would show up. That was the Jewish understanding. And this living, breathing, personal Messiah would have a literal restoration of the Davidic throne. That is King David, the glory of Israel. It would all be established again there in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. He would set up, the Messiah would set up his kingdom. It would be a political kingdom. It would conquer its enemies. This was a Jewish understanding. There would be then the personal reign of the Messiah on David's throne. It would be established. There would be a palace. There would be a government. There would be uh, those who rule with him. And the, the uh, kingdom of God would be established by the coming Messiah on David's throne. They believed that when the kingdom of God was established, there would be the exaltation of Jerusalem and of the Jewish nation. They believed that all the nations would flock to Jerusalem, that Jerusalem and the Israel would be the superpower, that the house of David once again would, would be the superpower of the world, that all of her enemies would fall in that day when the kingdom was established. They believed the uh, fulfillment of the prophetic descriptions of the reign of the Messiah. For example, they believed that in that day the mountains would drip with sweet honey. They believed that the lion and the wolf would lie down together. By the way, uh, the, the uh, scripture doesn't actually say the uh, lion and the lamb. You can look it up in Isaiah. It says uh, that the, uh, the, 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 the lamb and the wolf will lie down together. There's a lion in there as well, but they're not lying down together. We mix that up just a little bit. But they believed in that idyllic existence when the kingdom was set up by the personal, real uh, human uh, Messiah that uh, this kingdom would come. Now, that was their understanding. So when John came and he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, everybody had this idea. You mean the Messiah is here? The Davidic throne is going to be restored? The Messiah is going to reign on the Davidic throne? Jerusalem is going to be exalted, no longer under the hand of, hand of Rome anymore, and all the enemies that it's been since the, the days of Babylon, it had uh, scarcely, just in the days of the Maccabeans, had a little bit of, of uh, its own independence, but it had always been under someone else's hand. But now it's going to be independent on its own and ruling over the nations that surround it. There's going to be a fulfillment of these beautiful, wonderful days of creation as it should. That's at hand, John the Baptist. That's what you're preaching. And John would have said, yes, exactly. That's what I'm preaching. Now, uh, as uh, we, we, we see, okay, if that was their understanding, then we have to ha ask a question. Where did they get that understanding? Where did they come up with that idea? I want us to uh, look at a scripture that I think gives a good example of this understanding, if you would, and that's Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 79. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 67. Uh, and here is Zechariah. You remember he's the father of John the Baptist. And Zechariah, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, you notice, he says. So these must be good words, right? Filled with the Holy Spirit, he prophesied. So these are the words of God, really. And here's, what, here's the prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. When the kingdom comes, his people are going to be redeemed. Verse 69, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Where? In the house of David, his servant. This was a Davidic kingdom. Verse 70, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. What was Zechariah expecting with the coming of the kingdom? Salvation. What kind of salvation? Salvation from our enemies. Might help you to realize that uh, salvation in heaven was not a concept even understood in the Old Testament. Salvation, earthly salvation from the enemies, that was understood all the way through. Verse 72, to show mercy toward our fathers. Who's our fathers? That's the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. 
when the kingdom comes, the enemy will be put at bay, and mercy will be shown to our fathers, and notice in verse 72, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father. But what did he swear to Abraham our father? You're going to be a great nation. Exactly, Lorianne, the kingdom is Jewish here. You're going to be a great nation. You're going to not only be a great nation, but you're going to have a great land that will be given to you. So Zechariah, remember, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesied, hey, the kingdom's about here, and we're going to be redeemed. Our enemies are going to be put at bay. We're going to uh, have the Davidic king, the throne reestablished, the nation which is ours, and the land which is promised. We're finally going to get it. Abraham never got it. You remember Hebrews? But Zechariah says, hey, we're going to get it, verse 74, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear. This was the Jewish understanding of the kingdom, is finally the Messiah would be in their midst. They would be able to serve him without fear, verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, using an Old Testament scripture uh, here uh, from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. So, hey, my son, Zechariah says, under the, the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Zechariah says, you're going to be a prophet of the Most High, that is, of the Messiah. You'll go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Verse 77, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, which with the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine on those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. And that child continued to grow. Now, I think that passage of Scripture explains very well what the Jewish understanding of the kingdom was. Salvation? Yes. Spiritual? Yes. But our enemies are going to be defeated. Rome is going to be defeated. A kingdom is going to be established right here in our midst. Now, this was the Jewish understanding. So here is the million-dollar question. Were they wrong? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what they understood the kingdom of heaven to be. Were they wrong? We already saw a few websites that said, yeah, they were wrong. Jesus came to correct their misunderstanding is what so many of these uh, uh, commentators say. So were they wrong? Well, I, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time saying Zechariah was wrong. Zechariah didn't get it. And John the Baptist, who understood this uh, physical kingdom, I have a hard time believing that John was saying, hey, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, but he didn't have a clue what he was talking about. I have a hard time having Jesus sending out his disciples and, and that the group of 70 saying, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And he knew that they had the wrong understanding, but, uh, but, but he let them do it. As uh, Kevin say, uh, says right here, Jesus would have corrected them if they were wrong. Jesus corrected them about a lot of things, didn't he? But Jesus never corrected them about their understanding of the kingdom. We'll walk through some of these scriptures and uh, look at uh, some of this. So as uh, we, we come to all that, we have to ask then this very important question, and that is, what is the kingdom of God? A hundred and one, two, three times, there it is. What is it? Well, here's my answer. It is the coming millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It wasn't known to be a millennium until the New Testament. But... It is a kingdom which will uh, be established forever, and the part of it we know is this thousand-year reign of God. So here it is. The, 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 the kingdom of God is at hand. It hadn't, it hadn't happened yet. It hadn't come. And don't worry, uh, uh, Gene, that you're confused uh, because as uh, we come along here, there's a lot of confusion going on. And right now many are saying, well, wait a minute. I, I thought we were in the kingdom, but now you're saying the kingdom is the coming millennial reign. And so what is it that we, were, we are in and what's the church and what do we do with the fact that the kingdom of God is within us? Je didn't Jesus say that as uh, Jeannie from Pennsylvania says? And, and uh, just, I mean, your mind's going to spin and say, what is this? 
this. Now, you're going to have to hang with me as we put this together, and we'll see that, uh, that the, 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 the apostles, John the Baptist, uh, the Old Testament prophets, they were completely right. In fact, I just I have a uh, hard time when I hear someone say, now those, uh, those apostles, I mean, they were just a bunch of buffoons. Jesus was trying to get them to understand that it was a spiritual kingdom. They never could understand that. They always kept thinking it was be a political leader. They never got it. And then I'm thinking, wait a minute. Isn't, isn't the church built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, but the, the prophets didn't understand it? They didn't get it? They didn't know it? That, that's hard for me to uh, figure out. In fact, uh, as uh, we uh, consider those apostles, let me go uh, back to Acts uh, in just a moment, uh, for just a moment. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. And uh, the scripture says, that uh, in verse 3, when Jesus had been raised from the dead, it said he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them, to the apostles, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. And what did they do in that 40 days? Notice this, speaking the things concerning the kingdom of God. So you mean to tell me that Jesus spent 40 days post-resurrection with his apostles and he was giving them a 40-day seminar on the kingdom of God. That seems to be what the scripture says. Speaking the things concerning the kingdom of God. So, at the end of those 40 days, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. And they ask him, you remember, that one final question. Here it is, verse 6. Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? <laughs> Do you mean to tell me that you're saying the disciples didn't get it, and after a 40-day seminar with the post-resurrection of Jesus, they still didn't get it? I, I, can't, I just can't buy that. I can't swallow it. You know what it seems like to me? That the disciples perfectly understood the kingdom of God. The thing they didn't know about was timing. And so they come to the end, and they ask Jesus a timing question. Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times. You, you got everything right. But I am, I'm not going to give you the timing. So I believe the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, the restoration of the Davidic kingdom, that is the millennial reign of Christ, that is the kingdom of God. Now, put this together with Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. You see, if, if the kingdom is when Jesus is here physically ruling on this earth as he is in the millennium, what is added to us in that day? All these things. In the days of the kingdom, we're not missing anything, are we? It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then, then, that's a time word. When the kingdom of God and his righteousness comes, then all these things will be added unto you. And the word is, hey, right here and now, I can't help you. Uh, you, you, you may be poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. But then all these things will be added unto you. You see, in, in fact, uh, the, even the context of, uh, uh, of Matthew 6.33 is that context about how there may be persecution, there may be poverty, there, uh, there, there may be sickness that comes upon you. And so how do you put Matthew 6.33 and the common understanding together? I don't think you do. I think it makes no sense at all, which is why the church is so confused. So uh, back to our discussion, what is the kingdom of God? It's the coming millennial reign. I think then the kingdom of God is physical. The kingdom of God is on earth. It's in a particular location. It, it has a realm in time and space. Now, uh, by, by physical, do I mean there's nothing spiritual about it? No, uh, it's very spiritual in that sense. Just like you may go to church and it would be a very spiritual experience, but you went there physically. And I'm saying when, you, when we're in the kingdom, we're going to be there physically, that the kingdom has a location, and uh, that location is on earth, a particular location, Mount Zion, in the realm of time and space. This is the kingdom. Not only is the kingdom physical, but I believe the kingdom is future. It hasn't begun yet. It hadn't taken place. It hasn't started yet. You and I don't live in the kingdom. It is yet to come. It is coming in a future day. And then I believe it's fraternal. Now, I chose that just because it has a nice F sound. But that is to say that the kingdom has a uniquely Jewish nature to it. I'm not saying that only Jews are going to be in the kingdom. That would uh, every, uh, All of Scripture would go against that. But 
What I am saying is that it does have the preeminence of Jerusalem and the preeminence of the Jews in the kingdom of God. It is a really a uniquely Jewish uh, nature of the kingdom. Read uh, like Zechariah chapter 14, for example, and you can uh, come to understand this. So the kingdom of God, what is it? It's physical, it's future, it's fraternal. That is, it's a, it, it happens after the second coming. We ought to seek it. We ought to look for it. We ought to pray, thy kingdom come, as uh, we can uh, consider this. Now, I want to speak to that last point just for a moment, the kingdom's Jewish nature. This week I uh, was um, uh, arguing just a little bit on one of these blogs. I, a lot of times I, uh, many times I don't even read them. Sometimes I do read them and uh, don't very often comment. But this one I did comment uh, because of a little connection I had. And uh, Dr. Everett Berry had a, a discussion on his blog, and I'll give you the link to it here in a moment that you can go later. And uh, it was about Israel and Israel today and about uh, prophecy, but uh, just a little piece of it. I, I put a comment to Dr. Uh, Dr. Berry, who, and, and my comment was this, uh, Christ is the true Israel. That's what he said. Christ is the true Israel is the neo-replacement theology that's in vogue today. It enables one to disclaim traditional replacement theology, that is the church has replaced Israel, but still not hold to a unique eschatological position for the Jews. So I said, Dr. Barry, I can't take this idea you've got that Christ is the true Israel. I said, that's replacement theology. You haven't replaced it with the church, but you've replaced it with, with Christ. And, and you said all who are in Christ then are going to receive the promises that were to Israel because Christ is Israel. Now, I said, Dr. Barry, your position doesn't hold for an, a unique eschatological position for the Jews. Here was uh, his response. He said, I believe Israel is unique in that it is an ancient nation of people through whom God brought the Messiah and consequent blessings to all nations who believe. They are also the people that Christ came to initially because of God's covenant promises with them and culminated in their work of the Redeemer. And in the end, their Davidic king will reign over the earth and all Jews who become believers will inherit a kingdom. If you are wanting more of a unique role than that, I guess we'd have to hash it out another way. And I guess we would have to hash it out another way because here this reign happens to be to Jews who are believers, and especially if you be, click the link and read the, the rest of the comment, to anybody who's believers, all who are believers receive uh, this issue. So we're going to nail some of this down as we go through this issue on the kingdom of God. And here's some of the questions we're going to look at, not this week, but uh, beginning next week. We're going to ask, what about all those scriptures that seem to say the kingdom of God is spiritual? Like uh, Jeannie's uh, question, does Jesus say that the kingdom of God is within us? And that's an interesting one. We'll look at more, Jeannie, as uh, we consider that one, because uh, the, uh, the, the word there, uh, that uh, is often used from Luke, that the kingdom of God is within you, Jesus was actually talking to the Pharisees. And it doesn't make any sense to say, hey, Pharisees, the kingdom of God is within you. Well, the Pharisees certainly weren't saved people by any stretch of the imagination. It was a lost group of people that Jesus was referring to that, that comment to. So we've got to look at it and see what that means, and we will look at uh, that issue and uh, some of these other scriptures that, uh, that seem to say the kingdom is spiritual. Now, what about all the scriptures which seem to say the kingdom already exists? We're going to look at some of those, and we're going to see, hey, does the kingdom already exist? We'll consider that in the future. Then we're going to look at uh, the issue of uh, what was the entrance requirement or the establishment requirement for the kingdom of God. If, uh, if John comes preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what was it they needed to do? We're going to look at that for a very specific reason, to see whether or not the kingdom has been established. We're going to ask, did the kingdom message ever change? It will be an important and I think enlightening uh, topic when we get to it. We're going to ask, is the gospel of the kingdom different than the saving gospel? Because all through the scripture, uh, through the Gospels anyway, you hear this phrase, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Well, is that the same as I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation? We're going to look at that and uh, consider that issue. 
And then we're going to ask the question about what happens when you assume a present and spiritual kingdom. We're going to see some of the errors that come about if you say the kingdom of God is wherever he rules and rain. So there's a little bit about uh, where we're heading. So I've given you a little bit of an overview tonight, a little bit of an introduction about uh, the uh, kingdom of God and, uh, and, and, a, and a bottom line that the kingdom of God is the millennial reign. So I'll take your questions here in uh, just a moment uh, as uh, uh, you can go ahead and uh, type them in in the Ask a Question box if you'd like to. But before I take your questions, uh, let me encourage you to go to randywhiteministries.org, our website. Find up for our newsletter there. Uh, if you haven't done so, actually, by registering for this class, I'll sign you up for the newsletter automatically. But uh, uh, we'd love to have you visit on our website or send me an email. I like to get your questions and try to answer your questions and keep in touch with you by email, randy at randywhiteministries.org. If you sent me one and you hadn't heard back from me, then send it again. Uh, on the radio, uh, which you can listen to on the uh, Internet, uh, by the way, and uh, – I uh, hope you certainly will. Our program uh, right now, we're walking through Ephesians chapter 4, The Mystery Applied. We're going to do that through Wednesday and then, excuse me, through Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, I'll begin a series on biblical numerology. So that'll be on the website uh, probably beginning about Monday. Uh, interesting uh, uh, about uh, uh, six or seven uh, broadcasts that we'll have on biblical numerology. And uh, we've got some openings uh, for me to come to your church or your uh, home group and lead a uh, Bible study on the seven churches. Uh, we can do it in a uh, six to midnight is often how I uh, do it. Several of you have been to those. Or uh, we can do a, uh, uh, something uh, a little different schedule a Friday night, Saturday morning, or several nights in a row. If uh, we can work out that schedule, we'd love to come and uh, do that in your church or even in your home Bible study group uh, if we can work something out. So there's our official Bible study for tonight. With that, uh, if you need to go, I appreciate uh, you being here tonight uh, for this hour to talk about the kingdom of God. But uh, others of you may want to stick around and have some questions, and so we will enter into these uh, questions right now. Let me... Uh, see Sandy's question here. It says, uh, just looked up Psalm 103, if I'm not mistaken. That's bless the Lord, O my soul, uh, and all that is within me. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. However, Sandy says, I memorized it from King James Version, which says kingdom and not sovereignty. So I can see why, uh, why, why there's so much misunderstanding. Yeah, excellent, uh, excellent word here, and let's uh, just uh, look at that very quickly here, uh, Psalm 103, and I'm not sure, uh, verse 19, it looks like, is where we are. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, his uh, sovereignty, and uh, let's check that, uh, that word here with uh, Strong's, which we may need to check a little uh, differently. Uh, kingdom, let's see, uh, Try this another way. We may have to do a little bit of work on this, Sandy, to uh, come to understand. But uh, it does look as if it uh, goes b back and forth between uh, kingdom and sovereignty and reign. Um, so it's a um, uh, kind of a broad word. So I'm not going to be able to speak to it uh, too much over here. But uh, uh, let me let me show you one that um, is a uh, there are several psalms that are very clear. Uh, psalm 110, for example, the Lord says to my Lord. Now, that's interesting. You've got two lords here, don't you? The, uh, uh, the Lord Yahweh says to my Lord, Adonai. Let me just interpret that very quickly for you. Uh, that uh, uh, God the Father says to God the Son. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Now, where is our Savior today? Where is Adonai? Where is... Uh, where is uh, Jesus Christ the Messiah right now? He's at the right hand of the Father, right? Sit at my right hand. What? Until, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So he's at the right hand of the Father. He hasn't made the enemies a footstool for his feet. But if uh, we were to go to uh, Psalm 2, we would see about the, the nations are uh, in an uproar 
and uh, they, uh, they, they laugh uh, at, at God, but God laughs at him, and he says, the day is coming when I will install my king upon Mount Zion, my holy mountain. I will uh, say, you are my son. Today I have begotten of you. Ask of me, and I will give the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possession. Remember, that was what Satan tried to do. Uh, he said, hey, why don't you ask of me? And, and Jesus is saying, no, I don't ask of you. I ask of the Father, and he will give to me. He doesn't have uh, that uh, yet. We'll look at Psalm, Psalm 2 before uh, we uh, continue on. Rhonda says, when the church is raptured and the Lord comes back to earth, will we be with the Lord on earth during his millennial reign in heaven? Will we go back and forth from heaven to earth? Well, the first part of your question I can answer uh, very unequivocally, and that is, yes, at the second coming. Now, there's the rapture first. And uh, then after the rapture, there is the uh, tribulation. And after the tribulation, there is the second coming. We who have been raptured will return with him at the second coming, and we will be on the earth during the millennium. Uh, the question on will we go back and forth from heaven to earth uh, is, uh, I think, one we, we don't have the answer for. Uh, and... Uh, my guess is that there's not going to be any uh, reason that we would want to with the beautiful way that uh, earth is made in that day, but I don't have uh, an answer. But yes, we will be here for the millennium. Uh, Gene asks, uh, what things will be added? And uh, that is from Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added unto you. In the context of Matthew 6.33, it's food and clothing. Uh, but in the understanding of the kingdom, really, uh, poverty is eradicated, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the hatred and the deception of the enemy are eradicated. So all these things of the blessings of life are added to us. Uh, uh, and uh, we're, we're brought into an age in which uh, really prosperity and peace and utopia are added to us. Ron says, what will believers be doing in the millennial kingdom? What roles will we have? Is the millennial kingdom still considered heaven for us? That's an excellent question, Ron. And uh, the first part about it is uh, a little difficult for me to answer, but I'm going to answer in a general way anyway. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is what role will believers have in heaven? Believers are uh, the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. And I think that role continues on into uh, into heaven. But Paul talks about how we will reign with him. And John talks about how we will reign with him. So in some manner, there is a reign. Now also in some manner, there is a reward that's given. And I think these are millennial rewards that are given. Uh, as uh, we come in wood, hay, stubble, uh, gold, silver, precious stones, there are rewards that are given. And so somehow those are given and carried out. Maybe even now, it's hard, it's hard for me to know uh, whether this is exclusively Jewish or not, but you have the, uh, the parable of the one who's uh, given ten cities and five cities and one city. Uh, so maybe there's the reign in that sense. Now, uh, the, the challenging part for me is that, that I need to do a little study on is, is all that exclusively Jewish and the church has this role of the bride somehow in the palace, or how does all that work together? I'm not completely sure. Uh, on how to uh, answer the question. And, and then you say, is the millennial kingdom still considered heaven for us? Now, I think uh, if we were to do a study of heaven someday, what we'd find is that the popular conception of heaven is really the new heaven, the new heaven and the new earth. At the end of the millennium, when, uh, when you have the streets of gold and the gates of pearl, that's the, uh, that's the new Jerusalem, actually. And that's our, our popular concept of heaven. And we think of an individual, they die and go to heaven, and they're walking, they, they arrive at the pearly gates, and they're walking on the streets of gold. But really, that's a description of future heaven, of the future capital city. Now, I think uh, if, we, if we consider heaven in a, um, in, in, a, in a general sense, a simple sense of being with the Lord, then yes, the millennium is that. And immediately... When a believer dies, he's absent from the body, and he's present with the Lord. And the Lord is at the right hand of God in heaven, where John appears in John chapter 4, uh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 4 and 5. So uh, we, we, we go to that heaven, and then we come to the millennium, which is a, a, a utopia, a paradise, and then we go into the new heavens and the new earth. So all of it to say uh, it's all a very good thing. Uh, Jet says, if the kingdom of God is a literal kingdom, why does Jesus say in John 18, 36, 
my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest from the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. We'll get into that uh, uh, scripture in the future week, Jeff, to look at it a little more closely. But let me just give you a brief answer here. You remember some of the scriptures we had in the beginning that says it's the zeal of the Lord of hosts that is going to accomplish this. That the king is going to, uh, the, 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 the God the Father is going to look to his son and says, now, I give it to you. Go. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And his kingdom doesn't need uh, Jewish disciples fighting for it in order to establish it. His kingdom will come from another place and be, uh, be placed down upon this earth. So it is not of this world. It, it's not a grassroots kingdom, but rather it's a top-down kingdom that is established in that way. We'll look at that uh, a little closer, uh, Jet. Carla says, and Carla, uh, perhaps this is your first time with us, I'm not sure, but if it is, welcome. I uh, hadn't seen the name before or recognized it. It says, Christ is the true Israel was a phrase that showed up in a Bible study my husband is attending. Is there any scripture that they are using to arrive at this statement? Uh, Carla, that's a great question. And uh, I have only seen this statement come up in, uh, it, in, in recent years. And the, uh, the, there's a, a group of... Um, often Calvinists, but not always, uh, individuals, Russell Moore, uh, uh, who's the president of the Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, I'm not a Russell Moore fan, he uses this phrase a lot. And as I began to read his theology, I began to say, oh, now I, 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 see where, I see where he's going here. And it, it was new to me, Christ is the true Israel. So I think this is something new. It's certainly in vogue today, by, by the neo-Calvinists, at least, if not some other individuals. And uh, I don't know of a passage of Scripture that, that uh, backs that up. I'll try to look, see, Carla, if you'll send me an email, randy at randywhiteministries.org. I'll, I'll, I'll research that because I'd like to do that uh, anyway and uh, see what that is. But I think it's just a new way of coming up with a replacement theology without having to admit to replacement theology. Uh, Alex from Florida says, since God promised an everlasting kingdom, why is the millennium the kingdom uh, when, when it isn't eternal? And uh, I, I sort of misspoke earlier when I uh, spoke of uh, that. The millennium is the part that we know of. We know that at the end of the millennium, there's a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. Remember, the new Jerusalem is the capital city of that eternal heaven. And that, in, I guess who reigns from that? New Jerusalem, Christ the King, who will reign on the, on the throne of David over the house of Jacob. He will reign forever. So it is an eternal kingdom. And the uh, portion which we have some understanding of comes uh, from that thousand years. Kevin in California says a, a comment here. Not only did Jesus not correct the Jews on their view of the kingdom, but neither did the Jews argue with Jesus about the nature of the kingdom. If Jesus had promoted a spiritual-only kingdom view, the Jews certainly would have argued with him about that. Jesus was in no disagreement with the Jews regarding the nature of the kingdom. That's an excellent uh, comment, Kevin, that there wasn't, uh, wasn't an argument going either way, was there? And uh, that picture that I gave of the Jewish understanding of the kingdom was uh, one that uh, Jesus uh, accepted, and they accepted Jesus' view. I think it's the uh, modern teachers that have uh, had it wrong. Uh, Greg says, when they asked Samuel for a king, God said that they were not rejecting him, but God. Was this a rejection of God's kingdom? Well, uh, in a sense, yes, it was, because they had the taste of, they, they didn't have the kingdom, but they had a, a foretaste of it in the theocratic kingdom. And the theocratic kingdom is what they had before they decided that uh, they, want, they want their own king. And so, yes, in that sense, it was a rejection of God's kingdom. And uh, excellent point that you uh, have, Greg. And we're actually going to look at that rejection of God's kingdom in the future. Lorianne from Tennessee says, uh, will we, the church, live in heavenly places or on earth during the kingdom? Do you think we will rule and reign with Christ and judge the angels on earth? Uh, that's another one that goes again with uh, Ron's question there a little bit, uh, Lorianne. And I think that we'll live on earth. I think that we will reign with him. And I'm going to do some study to narrow that down to find out exactly what the church does and what the church's role in the kingdom is. 
And I uh, appreciate that question. We'll uh, come and look at it. Sandy asks a very good question. Are children born during this time? And the answer is yes, just not to you and me. Because you and, I, you and me will be raptured. We'll have our glorified bodies. And, uh, and uh, yet there will be people who come into the kingdom without uh, having, having their glorified bodies. And uh, the saved of the tribulation, for example, the Jewish remnant will come into the kingdom uh, in their uh, unglorified body, for lack of a better term. They'll live through that time. They'll have children. And uh, those children will have to make a decision about the Lord. Remember, when you come to the end of the millennium, that the devil has been uh, bound up for a thousand years, and he's let up just for a time, you remember, and a whole army gathers together with him and goes with him. I think that these are, many of these are the children born during that time. By the way, it uh, speaks of the, uh, the, the bent towards sinning that each one of us have, uh, that we ought never to trust ourselves. We need uh, someone around us. We need the Word of God around us uh, at all times. Um, and uh, Rhonda mentions a uh, scripture, uh, referring to a comment earlier from Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, which says, uh, yes, I think this is uh, related to, uh, I believe it's Carla's question. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say to his seeds, referring to many rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. My guess is they are going to go from that in saying that Christ is the new Israel, that everything comes together then uh, is, is uh is accomplished in Christ, and uh, the, uh, the, the problem with that uh, concept is you begin to build this idea that really only the church gets the promises. Uh, those who are, uh, who are saved by Jesus Christ in the church age where they lose their Jewishness, and so the Jewish nature of it goes away if you still have the church. That may be confusing to some of you. We'll have to pick up on that later. Lorian says, does God the Father come down in the new Jerusalem when the new heaven and the new earth come? Uh, Lorian, I'm going to have to look that one up too and tell you, I believe that uh, that is the, it's the, new, uh, the new Jerusalem in which there is uh, God, God says, uh, I will be their God and they will be, with my, they will be my people, but there's, there's God the Father in the midst. I'm going to have to check that one out towards the end of uh, Revelation. Great question. And uh, then Louise of Lancaster says, if we live on earth, won't our glorified bodies be soiled? Uh, well, uh, I'm going to say no. Uh, I don't know exactly how that works other than the fact that God's going to do a lot of remodeling of the earth between now and then as well. That's uh, one of the roles of the, of the millennium even is to uh, remodel this earth. So you all ask uh, hard questions tonight. And uh, I appreciate uh, all of them and the goodness uh, of them. And uh, always uh, good to be with you. I, several years ago, I came to a realis realization that I didn't understand what the kingdom of God was. I was the preacher. And uh, preaching and teaching it wrong. And what a difference it has made. I tell you, I've had to, uh, to, to relearn what I, say, what I say. And I had to go and... Uh, throw away a lot of my old sermons. I have a hard time on the radio program. If I go back to old sermon, I find out I don't agree with myself because I've changed my thinking. But I used to do like so many of you do, and uh, you hear all the time, I would talk about, uh, well, let's go do kingdom work. Well, how can we do kingdom work when the kingdom's not here? And, uh, you know, we're just, we're, we're just trying to expand the kingdom. How can we expand a kingdom that's not here? In fact, that will be done by the zeal of the Lord of hosts, not by me and you, not by our church work that's uh, done. So I had to retrain myself to talking about church work, the Lord's work, Christian work, but it's not all kingdom work. Kingdom work is yet to come, and I am still praying, thy kingdom come. Well, I hope you'll be praying it as well, because then all these things will be added unto you. And uh, before then, we get the rapture, too. Amen. The blessed hope. Well, thank you again for being with us. We'll be on next week, and here in just a little bit, I'll uh, put up the, uh, the, the link for next week's study. So uh, give me about uh, 20 minutes or so, and you'll have the link up there on the online Bible study page, and I'll send out... Uh, most likely tomorrow, a, a reminder or a few, excuse me, a follow-up that will have these uh, slides uh, at it. And uh, I uh, appreciate uh, Rhonda's comment. I wish we could have two or three hour long Bible studies. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm, glad it's, I'm glad it's fun for you, Rhonda. 
And uh, that's why from time to time here at First Baptist uh, Church in Katy, we have six-hour Bible studies on Friday nights from 6 to midnight. They're a lot of fun. And uh, we have a, a good time studying the Bible, those who like to study the Bible anyway. Uh, well, let me lead us in a word of prayer as we depart tonight. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these good people who come, and they're, they're, their heart is hungry, their mind is hungry for Bible study. And I pray that over these next few weeks of studying the kingdom, you truly would help us to understand what this kingdom of God is, to help us to understand it, not according to the theologians or the popular books or the pastors of the day, but to understand it according to your word. So we want to be good Bereans. We want to search your word. We want to come to understand a biblical uh, view of the kingdom of God and how that relates to our lives today. Guide us in this study, I pray, through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And God bless each one of you. So uh, nice to have you. We'll have this recording up for you very soon.